Origin of Financial Tithe. Introduction. In an isolated village in the lands of the kingdom in the interior of medieval Europe, there lived a devout Christian named John. John was a peasant who worked the land of a local feudal lord. Every year, he was required to pay tithes to the church, which consisted of handing over a tenth of his harvest as tax. Joao worked hard on his land, planting, caring for and harvesting his crops with great effort. He always reserved tithes for the church, believing he was fulfilling his religious duty. However, the strictness with which the church collected tithes often made his life even more difficult. In a particularly difficult year due to unfavorable weather conditions, Joao saw his harvest decrease significantly. He was worried because he didn't know how he would pay his tithes to the church. When it was time to pay tithes, the village priest came to his house to collect the due amount. The priest, following the strict rules established by the church, demanded that John hand over a tenth of his harvest, even though it was smaller than normal. John explained the difficulty he was facing and asked for understanding. But the priest insisted that he must pay his tithe regardless of the circumstances. With a heavy heart, John gave what he could as tithe, but felt the weight of the religious penalty for not being able to give the full amount. He reflected on how the strict tithing system sometimes made his faith an even greater burden. This story illustrates how, in the Middle Ages, many Christians like John faced difficulties in fulfilling the tithing obligations imposed by the church. The painful and rigorous system often placed an additional burden on the shoulders of peasants, even when they faced economic challenges. Justin Martyr and the Tithe. Year 100 to 165. Justin Martyr was a Christian apologist and martyr who courageously challenged the Roman government in his writings for its persecution of Christians. One of his books, Justin's First Apology, Section 67, describes in detail a typical Christian meeting where he talks about raising money. And those who are good and willing give what each man thinks fit, and what is collected is deposited with the president, who helps orphans and widows and those who, through illness or any other cause, are in need, and those who are in captivity and the foreigners who sojourn among us, and in a word takes care of everyone in need. We heed the words, do well, that he willingly gave to the common treasury for those less fortunate. This was given according to, what each person thinks is appropriate. It is interesting to note the absence of a legalistic command to give a certain percentage of income, that is, tithing. Tertullian and the Tithe. Year 160-220. Tertullian was the brilliant apologist and defender of the faith against the heresy of Gnosticism. His writings, Apology. Section 39, give us a glimpse of 3rd century fundraising and its purpose. Although we have our treasure chest, it is not made of purchase money, like a religion that has its price. On the day of the month, if you wish, everyone makes a small donation, but only if it pleases him, and only if he can, for there is no compulsion. Everything is voluntary. These gifts are, so to speak, the deposit fund of piety, for they are not taken there and spent on parties, drinking, and restaurants, but to support and bury poor people. To supply the needs of boys and girls destitute of means and parents, and of confined elderly people, also those who suffered shipwreck, and if there be any in the mines, or banished to the islands, or shut up in prisons, for nothing but their fidelity to the cause of the Church of God. They become the sucklings of their confession. Here is an example of beautiful and simple Christianity before it turned into a huge religious organization with all its bureaucracies that demands money and more money to stay afloat. Christians voluntarily gave small donations every month to a general fund to help those in need. The history of the church provides a real hobby horse, that is, it changes abruptly following the conversion of Emperor Constantine to Christianity. In 313 AD, 
This sovereign of the Western Roman Empire and Emperor Licinius of the Eastern Roman Empire jointly issued the Edict of Milan, a decree of religious tolerance. This took the Church off the state's list of enemies and granted it civil rights. Their confiscated properties were returned and Christians were free to participate in Roman society without fear. Naturally, this attracted multitudes of new members to the Church to the point that Emperor Theodosius I in 380 declared Christianity as the official religion. Thus the Church and the Empire formally became one. In this way, the marriage between the Church and the Empire was natural and inevitable. As the power of this world does not only pass through force and politics, but also through religion. It was natural and inevitable that all the complexity, hierarchy and organization that was created in the then Christian religion produced an expensive bureaucracy. The church developed a religious system of huge, extravagant temples, bishops, and priests to come between the people and God. All of this requires a lot of money, especially when tastes are good and hearts are greedy. Therefore, it is no surprise that the issue of collections soon came to the fore. According to research by Ph.D. David Croteau, several bishops during the late 4th century began to defend financial tithes as mandatory. Hilary of Poitiers, year 366, Basil of Caesarea, year 370, Ambrose, year 374, Chrysostom, year 375. Jerome, year 385, and Augustine, year 400. The need grew to the point that these individual requests for financial tithes turned into a unified demand from the clergy at the Council of Tours in 567 and the Second Council of Macon in 585. The years passed and the Church began to play a central role in people's lives, providing spiritual guidance, social support, leasing land as it also became the owner of large properties. It also offered people at the time protection, as the period was one of great political instability. Therefore, to finance all these operations and support its clergy and services, the church needed financial resources, therefore, tithing emerged naturally and spontaneously as a mechanism to collect these resources and keep the system alive. The Church began to justify tithing based on Scripture and the idea that those who received the spiritual benefits of the Church should contribute proportionately. Now, keep in mind that this tithing system was created by the Church throughout its history and then it used the Holy Scriptures to support it. They make many efforts to anchor their doctrine in the Bible. But they are all in vain, as its origin is human and has nothing to do with what the Most High prescribed for the nation of Israel during the validity of the law, studied in chapter 02 of this series. As Bible writer and teacher Eric M. Hill says, tithing is a bastard. He is the illegitimate son of a religious bureaucracy who impregnated himself and later claimed God as the father of his child. I agree that this word is strong and hurts. But I understand that it hurts not because it is irreverent, but because it is true. Biblical doctrine and history, as well as secular history, irrefutably deny the divine creation of financial tithing. Someone may ask, what would be the harm of this practice? Why can't I give my tithe without any problems? Well, answering the second question, as I said in other chapters, I believe that we live in the dispensation of grace and are guided by the law of love. So no one is prohibited from contributing to the kingdom of God or even to a complex institution full of bureaucracies that demand a lot of resources, such as the physical church on earth. On the contrary, praise and encouragement. The problem is to make true religious legalism of tithes as we see in temples in general. The first question is more complex to answer. Firstly because it is already a problem because it is not something biblical and Christian, and then this doctrine represents good news for the rich that, for them, giving 10% of their many incomes is not difficult at all. Comma. 
which is even comfortable to know that you are finding divine favors in reward for your tithes and not for the life of piety that the holy scriptures so urge us to follow. On the other hand, this gospel that is meant to benefit the poor ends up being a burden, as taking 10% off a low salary will certainly represent a lot. Each one should contribute as he has purposed in his heart, not reluctantly or out of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, 7